Hey guys, Tara here with a quick message before the show starts. Now for our Patreon subscribers, we have a really special incentive. We are doing our very first watch party. It's a Patreon exclusive on December 18th, 2023, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. Did I say that right? 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. We'll be watching an episode of Ultraman Tiga, followed by a short Q&A with um, writer Mike Pecorello. Um, so yeah, all you have to do is go to Patreon, pay the five bucks a month, and you get access to ad-free early episodes. Uh, lots of cool content on there like scripts and uh, videos, and now a watch party. So just head to patreon.com slash 4 flashback. Thanks. Welcome to... Four Kids Flashback. Hello, welcome to Four Kids Flashback. I am Tara Sands, joined by my co-host, Steve Yurko. Uh, Steve, I am, this is the first time I am nervous before an interview. Yeah, this, this one's... Quite different, to say the least. Um, it's it's a yeah. big one though. Uh, but I have like six pages of questions. I'm I'm like just nervous about getting everything answered. Mm-hmm. It's um, <sighs> yeah. Like I said, this one is definitely uh, our guest today. Is someone who could, who might possibly be able to answer a lot of things that uh, maybe so- someone on the actor side has had never had a clue on. Uh, right. We could maybe end the whole podcast after this interview because there'll be nothing, no more mystery. Okay, now I'm getting nervous, too. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I am really excited. Again, I also don't know how everything he was involved in. Um, I have, like, some licensing questions on here that might not be his area of expertise. I have censorship issues. I don't know if that fell mostly to the producers themselves on individual shows. You know, so... So I guess we'll get a sense early on of um, exactly all the things he was involved in, since there was so much going on there. He couldn't have possibly made every decision about everything. Yeah, who's to say? I mean, we'll find out soon. But, uh, you know, all this hype up, who who are we talking to? Uh, if you just so happen to well, blindly click this link and not even... Yeah, if the... you didn't read it, <laughs> sorry. And I guess it might not say exactly who he is. We're talking to Norman Grossfeld today, who was uh, the president of 4Kids Productions, the production side of the 4Kids company. Um, the 4Kids company, now that I've read a lot more, had all these different offshoots Um of companies that some were successful, some were not. Um, I don't know that we'll have time. My hope is that we uh, charm his pants off so that he'll want to do a part two. <laughs> yeah, I would say definitely calls for it. Listen, I know you, a lot of you guys sent me questions for him online. You said, if you're going to be talking to, to someone uh, at the company, please find this out. So I have a list of your questions that I do hope to get to today. Um or at least get email answers to if we can't get them verbally today. And I have a feeling that after this interview, you'll have even more questions. So um, whatever, you know, you'll, I know you guys like to school us on what we left out or what we got wrong. So, um, yeah, don't panic if we don't get everything answered today. That's my, that's my message to you. If every single question is not answered today, do not freak out. We uh, are still committed to getting answers to all your questions. Just hoping that we get like a pretty engaging conversation right from the get-go so that, you know, this might be more of a reoccurring thing. Who's to say? My biggest question about One Piece, um, and hopefully we'll get to this, is if it was acquired as part of a bundle uh, and sort of snuck in a deal that they did, or was it a separate acquisition i saw a lot of different stuff online about that that one you know it would be great for him to completely disprove that because i could even tell you i don't think that that that's actually false Uh, i agree i want to i want to get that theory disproved today mm -hmm. that is part of my mission is to dispel a lot of the rumors that i've seen online (gasps) we're we're like investigative journalists (laughs) steve (laughs) This is my dream of like hosting a true crime podcast, except the only crime that's been committed is censoring some cartoons. Well uh, said. <laughs> is that, yeah, I mean, yeah. And again, I, 
this is all done with love. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I am grateful for my time there. I think we're all, you know, grateful for the shows that he brought to us, uh, but primarily Pokemon, and I have a feeling this will be a pretty Pokemon focused uh, beginning yeah. of this interview. But why are we talking? Let's let's uh, shut this off and get to the the interview. I'll go get my Columbo trench coat. Please do. <laughs> Here we go. Our guest today is Norman Grossfeld. Now, Norman worked at 4Kids from 1994 to 2010 as the president of 4Kids Productions. During his time there, he licensed, produced, and wrote on many shows, music, movies that all defined your childhood, most notably Pokemon. And according to Wikipedia, he is the person who came up with the tagline, Gotta Catch Them All. Welcome to the podcast, Norman. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Is Wikipedia right? Yes, I remember. I remember that meeting very well because I went and I I was pitching uh, the people involved, all of our participants from Nintendo and Hasbro and Four Kids Four Kids Entertainment, which at the time actually was called Leisure Concepts Incorporated. Um, that I felt we needed a cat tagline or a catchphrase, and I remember coming into this meeting with a yellow legal pad where I had scribbled after thinking about it for a while, five, four or five different uh, taglines that I thought would be effective. Gotta catch them all was one of them. And I remember there was a lawyer, either a lawyer from Nintendo or a lawyer from Hasbro who said, well, you know, in advertising the kids, you're not allowed to be so declarative, like tell kids you've got to do something. You can suggest that they do something, but you can't um, say you've got to do this. And so there was a bit of a dis- discussion about everybody kind of like got to catch them all is the best. And then the lawyer was overruled. But <laughs> there, that, at that moment, it could have been that it wasn't got to catch them all. It might have been one of the other four. Do you remember what they were? Well, you know what? Catch them catch if you can was one of them that we, we went down a path for a little while. with. We even did a song <gasps> with that in it that I'm sure somebody could dig up one day. But wow. Ultimately, Gotta Catch Them All went, uh, was the winner. But yeah, so I remember that very, very well. So you had a crash course in the kid TV rules and regulations. Well, you know, it's interesting, and maybe this will be too wonky for you guys, but the whole rise of four kids really um, was because of the Children's Television Act of 1990. And it ultimately gave us an opportunity for a short while to become a big player in the business. If that act had not been passed, I think that the broadcast network, CBS, ABC, NBC, would have stayed in the kids' business a lot longer than they did. Um, But because of some of the rules that came down from the Children's Television Act, we don't have to get too mired up in that, but including having to have three hours every week of educational information, informational programming, every station needed to have those that had a broadcast license that disincentivized local broadcast stations from staying in the kids business and that put tremendous uh, pressure on the networks to get out of the kids business because their stations didn't want to be in it especially during the rise of uh cable as as cable television got more and more penetrated around the country Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon became much more popular and they were on 24/7 and so between the children's television act and uh, the rise of cable television, it kind of led to the decline or the demise of Saturday morning TV, the broadcast networks and the local stations wanting to be in the kids' business, which for a short time d- created this tremendous opportunity for kids to step into that space for a while, even though it was a declining business, and become a distributor and run the broadcast networks that we ran. Right. Um, so really, so yes, I did get a crash course, a crash course in all sorts of rules, but we took advantage of them as best we could. Yeah, so you're saying basically like this Fox Box block probably would not have been for sale at any other point in time because they just didn't want to handle it. Right, so so to get a little bit more detailed about it, uh, there before cable television became super penetrated, a big uh, toy companies and kids advertisers would advertise both on the networks nationally, but they would also buy mark, uh, spots in the local markets, a spot spots basically, um, market by market on all the individual stations around the country. So those individual stations were able to make money from the kids' business. Right. So that made sense for the local stations to stay in the business. But 
as the rise of cable TV came and Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network had so much programming, there were so many rating points available for these marketers to buy. All of a sudden, they didn't need to buy the local spots anymore from the local stations. So now the local stations are saying, we're not making any money on our kids programming. And not only that, we've got to run three hours of educational or informational programming for kids on our station in order to keep our FCC license. So they would call up Fox and they would call up all the networks were getting calls from their local affiliates saying, either supply us just three hours of EI programming or get let us out of the kids business because we're not making any money. We'd rather run infomercials. Wow. So really that's what happened. So then Fox Station, so Fox didn't want to get out of the kids business themselves. They sold the Fox Kids business um, well, Saban was running it, but Saban role sold the Fox Kids business to Disney, and Fox was left with the Saturday morning and uh, block. They didn't want to be in the Monday through Friday business anymore, mm-hmm. so they were left the Saturday morning block, and they leased it to four kids. How interesting. Okay, let's go back a little, and I would love to talk about your background, but I know we have we have to get you out on time, so what I'll make sure I do is post on our website a little bit more about your history in television, which is so interesting to me, actually. Well, you know what? I can tell you real quick, okay. you know, the, 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 the uh, not to go too deep into it, but the, the start of four kids, really. Um, I had worked on the Olympics in 1992 for NBC Sports. I was a coordinating director there. And I realized I didn't want to work for a big corporation after that experience. And I'd like to be something smaller. So I started a production company with a couple of friends in Los Angeles. And I was in New York. It was called Gold Coast at the time. We were with a CAA and and we got our agent got a call from Leisure Concepts in New York saying, hey, we've got this project. We we hired this production company to produce and we don't think it's working. We don't think we have a show. Do you have anybody that come take a look? So we got the call. I went to the offices of Leisure Concepts and that's when I first met Al Khan and Joe Garrity. Uh, He was the CFO. And they had the show that they were producing called Monster Wars. And they had hired a production company and they truly did not have anything. And they were already about a million dollars into the production. And so I came up with a concept for them to try to salvage the show because they had a toy line. It was Monster Trucks. They had a toy line they had licensed to Mattel to be part of their Hot Wheels line. And they needed to get the show in the air. So we produced the show. So we made a deal. We produced the show Monster Wars had a nice relationship. And then I had decided I didn't want to be partners anymore with my partners. And so I let uh, Leisure Concepts know, oh, I'm, I'm leaving, I'm moving on. It was great work. And he goes, hey, we really like you. How about you become the president of Four Kids Productions? We'll start a production company. Wow. So basically that was in 1994. So 1993 was the show Monster Wars. 1994 was this event happened. And so I was basically employee one of Four Kids Productions in wow. 1994. Yeah. So I know you were in Japan for the Olympics. Is that when some of this Pokemon stuff uh, appeared so we, to you? <laughs> no, no, no. So we were, so so. these Your Concepts had a number of large clients, but it's a very small company. The like Cabbage Patch Kids and- uh, Cabbage Patch was before Al used to work at Coleco and that was Cabbage Patch. But at the time I joined Leisure Concepts with Four Kids Productions, the major clients were a company called Tiger Electronics, um, and th- we did their media buying for them. And that's another story. Nintendo, we represented their merchandise licensing uh, for brands like Super Mario and Donkey Kong and things like that. And uh, we also represented WWF. Back then it was called WWF World Wrestling Federation. So we were their licensing agency. And that was the main business for Leisure Concepts. And there was a media buying business called Summit Media, which basically bought all of Tiger Electronics spots and media for them right. and tiger electronics was a major major shareholder of four kids so to, because of this relationship with nintendo they had pocket monsters in japan it was doing very very well for them but Jap- a nintendo of japan had very low confidence that pokemon would work outside of japan and most people at the corporate level of nintendo thought it would never appeal to Western audiences. And they thought there was too much reading involved in the game and that the anime style of animation wouldn't uh, compete well with the US style of animation. They had their reasons. And so Nintendo approached our company because we represent them for merchandise licensing and we had the divisions that were required to pull this off. They said, well, you have a production entity, you have a media buying entity, we might need that. And I'll explain why in a second. 
and you have our merchandise lights, like, would you guys be interested in helping us make this, see if we can make a go of it? And this was in 1997. And so we said yes, um, but the way the deal was structured for us is that we got a percentage of everything worldwide outside of Japan, except the trading cards okay, and except the video game because Nintendo considered those the core, like not the, li- the stuff that the- was being licensed that we were creating. So we made money off the TV or merchandise licensing or the TV show. So we had to make sure that the entertainment worked. And I will tell you that, um, and I probably have never told the story. Um, I will tell you that there was a meeting at the corporate level that I was involved in where it was actually being considered that we wouldn't do it. Wow. And that, and that a part of the company was saying, very conservative, they were saying, well, Nintendo, we make some money from Super Mario Brothers licensing and Donkey Kong. If we screw up Pokemon, it might sour the relationship and we might lose the client. Oh. And I, of course, I was a big advocate. We've got to do this. There's so much tremendous upside. What if it becomes what it's doing in Japan? Yeah. And so ultimately the decision was, let's go for it. But there was a moment where they were thinking, maybe we should outsource it to a Canadian studio and, and just handle, you know, the licensing and that's it. Huh. Um, so there was, a, you know, it was a little touch and go there for a bit. But anyway, we went forward with the business. That was 1997. And then in, I think it was November of 1997, it was like episode 39. So we made, we just signed our deal with Nintendo and we were going to shop it around and we were going to try to get it on a broadcast station if we could, but we had a backup plan in case we couldn't get it on a broadcast station. Uh, but then in, um, I think it was November, episode 39 of Pokemon just aired in Japan. And that was the episode with the strobe lights. Right. Were, the epilepsy, when, the, the seizure and, episode. Yeah, and so everybody around yeah. the country, because in Japan, Everybody had big TV sets, small apartments, and kids were up against the wall basically watching the TV. And of course, the strobe was so effective at that kind of environment that there were so many seizures that took place because of the strobe oh, lighting awful. effect. And then the not so funny, but funny uh, follow up to that was that on the evening news that night in Japan, they showed the clip to say what happened. <laughs> And again, it happened oh my God. to all the adults watching on the news. So that's horrible. Wow. We thought, you know what? Nobody died. Everybody was okay. It was just an interesting thing. And that show was decided would never air anywhere around the world. Um, but we thought, okay, you know what? This could be disastrous or it could just be the story is look how popular this is that this had this event. So we thought any kind of publicity like that was good news. Yeah. Um, and so we uh, went forward with the show and we did a little pilot. We showed it to all the broadcasts and cable networks. Can you imagine everybody passed? <laughs> so can you imagine being the executive that passed on Pokemon? Wow. And, for all, and for all the reasons that Nintendo was worried about, they were worried about the fact that, oh, this style of animation, I don't get it. How can there be a hundred characters? Who's going to keep track of a hundred different characters? And the animation looks crappy compared to what we run and whatever they said. Mm-hmm. So we couldn't sell it. And so we decided to syndicate the show market by market. Wow. And we, ha- we had 52 episodes to begin with. So we wanted to put sh- the show on Monday through Friday to maximize the exposure. But the networks, uh, broadcast networks at that time were Fox and Kids WB. They, um, so the cable networks already passed on the show. They programmed the best times of day. So they had six to 8 a.m. in the morning okay. for kids. And then kids would go to school. And they had three to 5 p.m. in the afternoon. Those were the best times of day. So we had to go to those stations and get the show aired adjacent to those time slots. And so, so we were on at 5.30 in the morning. We were on at 5.30 in the afternoon or six o'clock in the afternoon or whatever, not ideal time slots. And the way we were able to clear the show, because I told you a little earlier about the advertising environment and local stations were not making any money, Nintendo committed about $6 million of advertising wow. earmarked to, for, for the local stations. And Summit Media, our media buying division, was empowered to spread those dollars around market by market to secure clearances. So so Nintendo was actually saying, stay in the kids' business outside the broadcast networks you're already running, put our show on, and we'll advertise on your station. And so we cleared the show. And that so the show, so yes, I was in Japan for the Olympics in 1998, but that was just coincidental. Oh, okay. Uh, because I had a kind of an Olympics history 
And so I was already working at Forky's. I was working on this thing on Pokemon and a bunch of things, but I had committed to uh, cover figure skating uh, at the Nagano Olympics. So I was there just for that event uh, for, for a few weeks. And so actually I wound up uh, uh, hiring the translator I wound up using Paul, on yep. Pokemon. Paul's Paul, the one who told Paul, us, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so I met him there at the hotel. So um, we put the show in the air in September and within a few weeks, uh, it became, it was outrating the broadcast networks that were running in the ideal time slot. So they were running from, you know, when kids were really up and watching. So our 5.30 a.m. or 5 a.m. broadcast was exceeding the prime time for kids broadcasts of 3 to 5 p.m. after school or earlier in the morning when they got up 6 to 8 a.m. And all of a sudden we had a big hit. And so, of course, everybody that didn't want the show now wanted the show. That is fascinating. Okay, so yeah. in these, to rewind a tiny bit, in these early meetings with uh, the Pokemon team and Nintendo, did you ever, were there a lot of talks about westernizing the show and making it palatable for an audience? Or were there sometimes talks of, hey, let's see if we can do it as is and see if kids might take to it? Like, was that a so, debate? So it wasn't a debate. I was, it was me. I, I mean, I, it was left to me to figure it out. And I had strong feelings about it. So I remember um, I was at the NAFI convention in January of 1998. And I met for the first time, ShowPro, the production company from Japan was there and they were managing the process with Nintendo of America, but Nintendo of America was just beginning to get involved. And so they were, so ShowPro was like managing the process. And uh, from my perspective, we, as I told you earlier, our only way of making money we weren't making money from the video games. We were not going to make money from the trading cards. So we had to make sure the entertainment worked and we made money from the entertainment and then also the merchandise licensing that would follow from that. So I was super highly focused on doing everything we could to make it work. And from my perspective, uh, I had watched a year or two before, I think it was maybe the previous year, Sailor Moon was super hot in Japan. And there was all talk about it's going to take over the world and it's going to be amazing. And, you know, it was a lot of hype about Sailor Moon. And I think it was Deke Entertainment had the rights to it worldwide at that point mm -hmm. outside of Japan. And they went ahead and did just like a straight dub. And it didn't work at all. It was not it 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 underperformed everybody's expectations. It was just like a nothing. It landed with a thud. Mm. And so when I looked at Pokemon, I thought and I, I watched many, many, many episodes and I felt that the things that the people in Japan were worried about, they were right to be worried about. The storytelling style was different than the way we tell stories. The use of music was different right. than we use, how we use music. And the way that a comedy was being used was different. And so I made this pitch to ShowPro in January of 1990. I said, here's what we've got to do. And I said, we've got to do this. I want to change some characters and how they do. We've got to ramp up the humor. I want to change the music. And I want to rotoscope out every instance of Japanese writing on screen so that a kid in Italy thinks the show is for him and it was made for him so that a kid in Germany thinks the show is for him so that a kid in the United States thinks the show is made for them. So it doesn't place a nationality on anything. And they said, we trust you, go ahead and do it. And so way more expensive for us mm -hmm. and more difficult. But um, my feeling was we had to do that so that this could become a mass market hit instead of a niche anime show that might appeal to more hardcore anime fans. Right, and I think people who were upset about changes will take solace in the fact that this was all done with the Japanese company's blessing. And they understood the differences. It wasn't as if you took this license and said, we're changing everything. This, this was all. I mean, if you look at Pokemon uh, as, you know, so we, they were already in production on like hundred episodes or whatever, when we first started working with them. Um, but as the season went on, they changed some of the things like, you know, there's no more kanji on screen at all. And starting with season three, they got it. So that saved us some of the work we had oh, to do. Okay. Uh, you know, so, you know, so they, they made the adjustments too because they realized that this plan, this plan was working. Yeah, no, they, I mean, listen, we could have been, I could have been wrong about that, but I, I, I know, I would I've changed anything about it. No, it worked. obviously not. Yeah. It We're all talking worked. about you know, it so, still. So <laughs> yeah. Um, I know you worked on some of the music for Pokemon. Um, 
was there, I have a couple questions, but the theme song is so iconic, the first season theme song. Was there ever a discussion to keep that throughout the entire series? A little bit there was, but I think that we wouldn't have gained anything more from the theme song at that point. It became this iconic thing. that, And so our feeling was, and again, going back to pure money-making for four kids, mm -hmm. um, we had to make money from the entertainment, whatever that might be. And for me, some people would have stopped at the TV show, but I was like, no, let's do music. What else, what other options do we have Pokemon that to make Live. our money? Yeah. <laughs> right. Pokemon or the, or the movies and all of that stuff. And so it was better to change the song every year because it also, re you know, as they came out with new games and they had new um, worlds that they were exploring in the video game, we came out with theme songs to match up so that when they launched a new video game and we had a new TV series, we had a new song. And, but it gave us the opportunity to have a new album. Right. As well. Yeah. The music from in, from four kids in general is very iconic. John Siegler is is amazing, and I know you have a musical background. Yes. So were you? I mean, did, when you found Siegler, were you like, "Oh, this is it"? Like, I got the guy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, and the thing that was so great, and when I first started working with John and his team, uh, he was at a company called Rave a Music at the time when we first met, which were a few years before Pokemon. I went to them because I, I'm always a big fan of the theme song that explains the show, like Brady Bunch and things like mm -hmm. that. And I thought, oh, I always look at my philosophy about Pokemon, but all the shows that we did, and I wrote many of the theme songs with John or with Russell Velasquez or some of the other team, as I look at it as that 60 seconds is the best commercial for the brand. And let's it's like it's running a commercial for the property. And let's make sure that the theme songs really connect all of the marketing messages we possibly could do because it's going to be repeated and repeated and repeated right. every day. Right. And so that's why I'm so I was so focused on the music. And so Rave Music and John Siegler and the team there, they were they were writing jingles. That was their main business back in the day when jingles yep. were the hot thing on TV for all the different commercials. Where you had a second to write a hook. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so they were trained on that mm -hmm. and many, and I can't think of the things right now that they're famous for, but they've done a lot of the big jingles back in the day. So that's what I wanted for our music, for our shows is the things that super catchy that, you know, you, and you'll remember it. Right. Let's move on a little bit from, from there. I know the, the company went public around this, these early years. Did that change how you did business or was it more pressure for you? Yeah, you know, the, I, I, in, in many respects, we, we went public, we were always a public company. So when I joined the company back in 1993, when they were a client of mine, they were a public company called Leisure Concepts. I see. And it was always public, but it's more like a penny stock. And then when Pokemon hit, all of a sudden, it, you know, and the name of the company changed before it gets entertainment. Um, then everything happened and the company, you know, the stock price doubled and doubled and we split the stock a number of times. And then it became more about the stock. And as institutional investors found the company and they invested in it, the pressure became a lot more about short-term earnings instead of long-term strategy. And many people that were on the board and involved in the company that invested in the company had no entertainment background or they were not involved in the business whatsoever. And I think that was a negative, uh, put, put, put in, was a negative impact mm -hmm. overall for the company's longevity. Right. Actually, yeah. As, as you started to acquire more shows, um, and there's all sorts of rumors online about things like that One Piece was sort of an acquisition bundle. Um, do you remember if that was the case? So, uh, you know, One Piece, you know, in, in many ways it was One Piece that never happened for four kids because One Piece is a great property and a great brand. And um, we had uh, on the corporate side, so outside of four kids, outside of my realm, mm -hmm. um, on the corporate side, they had hired uh, some consultants that were always watching the Japanese market for what's hot and oh. to give us, er give us like early indicators of here's the next thing, here's the next Yu-Gi-Oh or whatever. And so... One Piece was really exploding there, and they and and so um, the idea was to let's get our hands on this. I think Kodansha was is the company with One Piece, right? And so or it was it Shueisha, Shueisha, mm -hmm. Shueisha. So we had already done uh, work with Shueisha in the past, and um, 
you know, to, to not defend what happened with, with One Piece, because there's really no defense for it. One Piece was not a kid's show. Mm-hmm. It should have never been a kid's show. It wasn't designed to be a kid's show. It didn't have a kid's audience. But the, our partners in Japan thought, let's try to sell a lot of toys. And 4Kids has a network. Let's make a deal with 4Kids. And so I can tell you that I just learned about the fact that we were getting One Piece right before we had a big event and some sort of like upfront event in New York uh, in the spring of whatever that year was. And I hadn't seen the show at all. And I can tell you that I'm pretty sure that nobody at the company had actually seen or watched more than three or four minutes of the show. And I didn't had seen any of the show. Oh my gosh. And so we made this big announcement at some like live event at some nightclub that we're getting one piece and it's going to be, and we, I think we didn't have a choir singing. You know, we, we produced this like <laughs> live events and like, it was like a wacky, it was like a wacky event. And um, so we had the show and then the show started coming in and it was really clear that it was not a kid's show. And we started sending the show to Fox um, because they had the sta- they had the standards and practices department there at Fox. And they said, you know, you've got to change this, you've got to change that. If you want to put this on our air, you've got to change all these things. So we went back to our partners in Japan and said, here's what the situation is. At this point, from my perspective, as far as, you know, so I had a lot of things going on. I was, I was running the Fox business, but also all the productions and distribution. And I think we were pretty soon we were about to also bid for um, the CW network network as well. We had a lot of things. We had the live show. So there's only so much of my time that I can wind up investing in something. And so I always look at like, where's our upside and where am I best deployed to make sure that four kids survives and is prosperous. It became pretty clear to me that this was not going to work. And I think we had some little bit of discussion because we were doing some business with Funimation at the time. And I think Gan and Funimation was like, you guys should just dub this or work with us to just do a straight dub of the show and release it on DVD and it'll be the better way. But in full concert with our partners in Japan at the time, we went forward and said, we're going to try to jam this into becoming a kid's show. Wow. And so it wasn't that that was, you know, four kids just did this in a vacuum. You know, this is, everybody was yeah. involved in this production as what it became. Um, but again, I, but for me, I was like, I, I, there's nothing I could have done to stop that at you that point. You wouldn't have acquired it, right? I, yeah. I, I don't, I don't, I personally wouldn't. Have, or, or you know what? I think that, you know, we were really stuck from a corporate thing about how are we making money. We're a kids' company, and we're going to sell toys. And but we had the studio operation, and we and the anime business was really growing. And and thanks in part to Pokemon, it exposed this this art form to many, many, many mm-hmm. people that then then investigated the art form for themselves more and more and more and started liking it and loving it and all that. And it made this anime business and Funimation's business and, and led the let, paved the way for Crunchyroll and all of that. Well, Four Kids was right in the middle of all that. And if we had been smarter about that, we should have probably started a division to be do more, you know, loyal, uh, you know, true dubs that the otaku would like versus just always focus on the kids angle. But we didn't do that. Well, you did. You know, with, hindsight you did with is twenty. Yu-Gi-Oh! And Shaman King both got um, uncut DVDs of a, of yes. some episodes. And there's a rumor. Again, this is why you're here to dispel rumors. Uh, that One Piece was partially dubbed in an uncut format, but then not released. You know, honestly, I, I actually don't really remember. Um, to be honest about that, I don't. I think that um, that that may have been a possibility, and we were talking to Funimation about that, but I don't really recall. Say, but the, yeah, the Yu-Gi-Oh and Shaman King dubs, yeah, there were a handful of episodes produced, uh, if you if you recall at all. But I was curious how what became of those, how those came and went so quickly. Well, I I don't know the timing, and I have to look back at the years of when all this happened. But um, as we started um, approaching the financial crisis of two thousand eight, um, things changed for four kids. And, and so a lot of businesses that we might have been able to get into, we weren't able mm-hmm. to continue to pursue because of the, the crunch that happened because of all the things that, that happened in 2008. 
I know you had to edit out so many things like guns and cigarettes. Funky cops got to keep their guns. Do you remember why that is? <laughs> I'm fascinated by this. I, I think it, 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 it may have something to do with what network we were on at the time, but I don't remember. I don't know. It, 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 it might have been in how they were pointed. You know, the standards and practices person gave us the guidelines that we followed. You know, if we were able to keep, and listen, I produced the show called WMAC Masters back in 1995, which was a martial arts action adventure. We didn't have a network. And to this day, it's still probably one of the most violent live action kid shows that has ever been produced. And we were, everybody's kicking each other in the face and the head. And there were all these, you know, crazy martial arts stunts going on. We didn't have a network to standards and practices department right. to tell us you can't do this, you can't do that. Nothing ever happened to any child that watched WMEC Masters. I think possibly we're not giving kids enough credit for being able to watch certain things or or whatever, because they're certainly able to go play a video game the next minute they stop watching a, right. a, a network television show and they're playing Doom back in the day, whatever, which is just somebody with a machine gun firing continuously for every single level is all they're doing. So I think that we don't give kids enough. I'm not advocating, well, let's have kids have, let's have all our shows have guns in them. But I'm just saying, I, I think that, you know, it, the, the line seemed to move a lot when you were dealing right, with standards and practices. Um, we'll move on to like a kind of a, a less fun time when Pokemon was, was ending for four kids. You still had turtles going on. You had all this other exciting stuff going on, but I'm sure, I mean, I, I also, I realized this Norman and, I, I didn't realize how young you were running this huge company. Like it's I'm still young. You still are, but I think, <laughs> you know, I looked at you guys as the suits and the executives and in retrospect I'm like, holy crap, like that was a lot of responsibility and just wanted to acknowledge that because it's a oh, lot well, it's you. pretty amazing. Um so so you find out uh that Pokemon is not going to be renewing its license. Did you find out as you were dubbing the eighth season? What was the timeline like there? No, I mean, it was pretty clear. Um, when we first made our deal, the way the deal worked is that Nintendo of America got all the rights from the consortium in Japan to take to represent the property around the world outside of Japan. And then they subcontracted with us to do actually do it. Okay. And so, so our day-to-day, -day, and I worked with this woman, Gail Tilden, she was my day-to-day -day contact at Nintendo of America, and we were the people that were doing this. Um, that contract was for 10 years, and we knew it was over. Oh. We knew that the 10 years were up. And so as, as we did everything we did, pretty soon after, maybe it was season four or three, they formed the Pokemon Company, and then they formed the Pokemon Company International, mm -hmm. And we basically saw the writing on the wall. It's like, okay, when the contract's up, we're done. Right. So, so yes. Okay. It wasn't, a, it wasn't definitely not a surprise, but we thought that perhaps there could be a continuing, continuing friendly relationship, mm -hmm. at least on the production side where, oh, we're, we're, you got to produce the shows. Oh, I see. I see. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll be able to work out something. Where will you go? You might as well stay with four kids because we have this all worked out and it's a machine that's working fine right and so this leads me because there's co conflicting stories from the actors about i had already moved to la at this point so i wasn't really involved in this but conflicting stories from the actors about why they couldn't continue some uh said that there was something called a sunset clause in our contract that wouldn't allow the actors to go to another studio and record it um others say that it was just the pokemon company who decided to revamp everything um, do you have, do you remember how all that went down? I, there was, there, so there was a clause in the contracts that we had on every show. And so it wasn't just Pokemon. That was basically to protect four kids, mm -hmm. um, which was that you can't perform the role that you perform for four kids for somebody else for a period of time. I think it was like one year after yeah. the last, the last time you performed it for four kids so that nobody could come in and just poach our business from right. us very easily. And it was just one of those standard things we had in the contract. So when the Pokemon company, I think, decided that they were just not going to stay with Four Kids Productions to do the production anymore, and they're just going to start up whatever, however else they were to do. And I, I don't really remember exactly what their strategy was, their plan was. The actors said, oh, well, we have this thing where we're not allowed for one year to perform this. And I think many of the actors came 
to me mm -hmm. or to sort of the people they were reporting to, to say, well, what about this? I said, will you enforce this? I said, I don't know if you just have to decide to do what you are going to do. I'm, I'm not in a place to undermine four kids productions business by, by telling you something or not. So ultimately the actors made their own decision. I see. Based on, based on who are, some of the actors made their, whatever way they made their decision, they made their decision. Right. We never actually enforced that clause. You know, people have to work and it's like having one of those non-compete clauses in a contract right. where you can't, you can't work for any company anywhere ever. <laughs> You know, it's like, well, how is that? Why would you enforce it? You know, people have to work and make a living. But we were also providing a very good living for some of the actors who were on many of our shows. Mm -hmm. And they were doing promotions with us and the different things. So they calculated for themselves whether they wanted to stay with the Pokemon role or not. Yeah, and those was, are tough that decisions. Was, I, yeah. I never, I never gave anybody advice on what decision to make. Yeah, that is, it was, it's a tricky time. Since we only have a few minutes left, we have some questions from fans. Okay. Uh, let's see. So, some, uh, there was a question about a show called Grand Caesar. Do you know anything about that? If that was going to be adapted? <laughs> the name sounds familiar, and I think they may have been involved in some uh, discussions about it, but I don't recall what that okay, is. Okay, so we can't answer that. Uh, one of the questions was about, there were some, some scandals, which I think are kind of funny in retrospect, uh, uh, things that went out like maybe with a phallic design on it, or uh, there was Kanikuman VHS tape that was recalled. Um, somebody wanted to see if you had any insight on that. I actually don't remember. I don't remember the Kanikuman recall, actually. I mean, there were some crazy things in that show. I mean, one of the characters was was uh, like a butt yeah. in that show. Yeah. One question I do have, I, I, I never hear this talked about. I'm wondering if you remember this at all. Uh, I think there was something planned where that character was going to host uh, an airing of the Fox Box. Yes, I love that. So we actually, uh, I, and I wrote that song. Uh, it was a very good, very fun. I, I think it was funny. It was um, where he, we had a whole song about him. So we promoted it for a week that this character, I'm trying to think what his name was, but but uh, you could look it up online and you'd hear the song. And we did we ran this promotion just for fun that he's become the network host for the following week. And then when the week happened, we had a voiceover character. Mike Pollock was pretending to be the head of the network or standards and practices and said, there's no way this is going to happen or whatever. And so... Uh, and he and it, and there was I remember a funny line at the end of that promo where he was basically fired from the gig, and he and he says uh, the character says um, is it because I'm French? It's like the last line of that promo. It's <laughs> kind of funny. You have to see the whole thing. But was, that, he, was he, that always the plan? Or? Yeah, it was always the plan. Oh yeah, that, that that's the way that whole thing was designed to just have fun. There were so yeah. many fun promos and things going on that I think I had no idea. Did you do you have any favorite moments of like from the promos that you did or Well, I think I think that was one of the funnier ones that that we did. But uh, you know, the whole the thing about for the promos and the whole TV business is uh we didn't really have the big budget to advertise off of our network. And so since we only had Saturday morning we were always just already talking to the fans that were already there. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, our promotions weren't really all that effective because we were only trying to get the people that were already at the network to maybe watch some other show I see. versus bringing people in from other time slots, you know? So we were at such a disadvantage to the Cartoon Network and Nickelodeon business models because they had all week, all different types of programming and all sorts of promotions that they could run to drive kids to different network times on their network. And we really didn't have, we really had a tremendous disadvantage. Now, my last question is, there is so much lost media from 4Kids. Things, shows like Tama and Friends. Uh, there's a whole bunch of shows that just never got released and people w would like to see them. Discotech is releasing some. Now, can you be the guy to bring back that lost media? Do you know where it is? <laughs> I would tell you, I, I, so I left the company. Um, my contract was up and I think my last day was like December 31st, 2009. And, and I, I didn't go back. Mm -hmm. I didn't take it. I didn't take anything with me. I didn't take any media with me. Okay. I think one of the biggest things that I'm 
I don't know what ever happened to it, but we, when we did Pokemon live, we shot with, you know, six cameras and we did two, two shows. We shot that whole live event. Oh, wow. And we have it. And, you know, we made a, a big production. We shot that in Chicago at a theater and it's that's lost. Oh, there's a, there's a fan video online of it, but it's yeah, so somebody blurry. shot it that yeah, way. Yeah. yeah. But, but we had a oh, professional man. production that we, we recorded. And so I'm, I'm sad that that, cause that was, you know, for, for what it was, you know, nowadays that show would be so much easier to produce, but yeah. you know, we had two giant projection screens and it was like a multimedia experience. And it was one of those things that was just like its own sort of crazy animal. Um, but it's lost. Oh. And I don't know what happened to those tapes. And if I did have those tapes, I would definitely, it never got edited also. It's just, we just, because we just never did it. Okay. If anyone's listening, who, ha- who knows where these tapes are? I, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. Yeah. All right. We have to let you go. Um, I just wanted to say to you, the reason I'm doing this podcast is because I go to all these conventions around the world and I get thanked by fans who grew up watching these shows. And I, I was such a small cog in this whole wheel. People tell me stories like, you know, a parents, their parents were getting divorced and they had Pokemon to turn to, or their siblings were fighting, but they could agree on Yu-Gi-Oh! Or they got beat up at school, but then they brought in this really cool Pokemon card or whatever it is. And I try to explain to them that, I, that I'm not the one they should be thanking. So I'm trying to talk to as many of you guys as I can to say thank you and on their behalf. And I hope you get to meet up with us at one of these shows at some point so they can say well, it to you. I- I will tell you this. I so I know you're you're Michael Hegney, mm-hmm. a dear friend of mine. He and he's at these shows also. Oh yeah. And I actually had one conversation I think with your agent. Oh. Where good. I was like, oh, I think I would love to do a panel or something at one of these shows because I bet there's a lot of people that want to ask questions or just hate me about One Piece or whatever it is. But I, I think it would be, I think it would be great because it'd be I think there's a lot of people that want to just either vent or say stuff or whatever. And there's. This, I mean, we only had 45 minutes today, but there was a million stories. Oh, we're you making know, you come back. Forget it. Yeah. We're, we're making a part two. But thank you. My pleasure. So nice to see you guys. And I appreciate being part of this. And good luck with this project. Wow. That was that went by so fast for me. Did that fly by for you? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah. By the, you know, by the seat of our pants there. But it. <laughs> But it was like oh, it was almost just like no nonsense. We were just getting right to right to it, and you know a lot of great discussions. You know, you know some, you know a few questions answered. But like I think it was very informative. And yeah. my only thought was like, oh, we were just getting cooking. Oh, I could have spent <laughs> six hours doing that intro. I had so mm-hmm. many questions. But I think the good news that came out of that is he is open to talking more about this and doing panels. And I. I'm going to start sending some emails as soon as uh, we wrap up here to see if I can make that happen. Um, and, and what I also learned is, and I was saying this to Steve, that Norman, being the president of the company, Norman was involved in such big picture stuff that a lot of the questions I have and the fans have is is so specific to a show. And that those were decisions really made by the individual producers of each show. There was no way... Mm-hmm. Norman could have known every single thing going on at that company. And and even without hearing a question, uh I I was getting some answers for mm-hmm. you know that you know for things I want to ask him about. Like he obviously, you know, he wasn't in the licensing department, so he, I don't like I was curious what his stamp of approval was if he had final say of every show that got licensed through four kids. Clearly not was, because no. he he found out that one piece was licensed. It wasn't even his. So I guess what didn't get answered though if it was at all part of a bundle, I it sounds like it was not. It sounds like it was a standalone thing that yeah. the overseas companies wanted to make toy money on mm-hmm. and that's why they sort of pushed for it to happen. If I could, uh, if I can make a stand here and kind of answer that, even though not being someone who didn't work there, but I think this was this this theory is all misconstrued from a uh, an ANN uh, podcast interview from ten years ago from someone who was working on the company who started working at Four Kids after they lost after. the license. I know. Yes, I know. Yeah. Okay. And they were just theorizing, but the the One Piece dub came out. Years before uh, Magical Dory Me, which is the other toy property, people were thinking like, "Oh, Four Kids was tricked." Right, so it uh, couldn't have been bundled with that. No, because... and also as as Norman was talking about, One Piece was huge in Japan. 
mm-hmm. like and and magical Dory me i'm sure there's fans out there it isn't the the juggernaut franchise that one piece is and so why would you think that four kids was really dying for this uh this you know magical girl show and they're like all right i guess we'll take this huge money maker in japan called one piece it, so i it, think we've dispelled that rumor today yeah in case then. people were still wondering i still see it passed around every now and then it's false it's it's the one piece dub uh beat out the the magical dory me dub by like a couple of years so yeah i the, one of the big answers i got was um i i forgot that they had seen Sailor Moon, I guess, not perform up to what people had hoped it would, and that that was a lot of the catalyst for westernizing the show, Mm -hmm. Um, which I know is, you know, people have issues with, and they're fine. It's fine that they have those issues, but I think when I I see that it was maybe a fear-based decision to change so much because they had a template Mm -hmm. in Sailor Moon, um, and also I I feel better knowing that the Japanese stamp of approval was, was... given to mm-hmm. most of these things, or at least the trust was put into them to do this. Um, in some of the DVD commentary I watched, which I didn't get to talk to him about, but, uh, you know, he would do screenings with the Japanese team of the of his version of the movie and the yeah. music. And they, in again, I could be wrong, but there wasn't as much music uh, done in the original films. And... I think we've spoken about this Western audience is kind of like wall to wall sound. Mm -hmm. Um, And he said that they really enjoyed it. They were very moved by the music. Um, And then you wonder too, like that it did it affect their movie making and going forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah. uh, What Tara's talking about is uh, there's a release of some of those Pokemon movies that have a commentary track with him and Michael Higney on there. Uh, yeah, and yeah, Norman's talking about all about the sensibilities of uh, American children versus Japanese, where it's like, oh, you gotta, you gotta state this, you know, this plot point more clearly because uh, it's left up to interpretation, and that could be a whole discussion on like whether or not, you know, whether that that's really right. true or you're not giving uh, American children. And we talked about this enough on the podcast credit, too. Yeah. Enough credit to to think for themselves or to pick up on that. Um, it would be an expensive uh, proposition, but I would love to show kids both versions, <laughs> one mm-hmm. with no, cha- you know, barely any changes, and one with lots of changes, and see the reaction. I, if that I could, is not going to happen. But if I could dial back to bring up the Sarah Moon thing, because people might argue with that. I think what. Norman might have been referring to at the time was Sailor Moon was syndicated as well. And that was airing like that, those 6 a.m., 6 30 uh, time slots, weekdays or weekend mornings on local affiliates. And it was not, fi- it, it was not finding an audience uh, in those time slots. Uh, mm-hmm. That's but a I th- good point. Yeah. But when, I think that so that might have been I think yeah Sailor Moon was still airing around that time when Pokemon was coming out but then when Sailor Moon got picked up by Cartoon Network and was airing on Toonami on week, weekend uh weekday afternoons that's when it found its audience and same thing with uh yeah, Dragon you're Ball right. Z Dragon that's Ball a great Z point. once Cartoon Network got it you know pr- uh, primo uh time slot right there as as it was that's discussed such in the interview a too good point yeah mm-hmm. And I so. guess those nuances, they didn't know that stuff yet. And again, I will mm-hmm. say that I do know people who watched that earlier version of Sailor Moon and loved it. So it's mm-hmm. not to say that there weren't people that loved it. It's and that, again, and you that, know, and that dub has plenty of changes akin to like a four kids dub as well. Uh, I'm curious what the the how the timeline was of how quickly Pokemon got picked up, like exclusively by Kids WB. To start airing on those Saturday mornings because I was introduced to it at six thirty in the morning, mm. uh, in local syndication, and then yeah, it blew up. Did you uh, purposely wake up extra early to watch it? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. That's so. I mean, I love that. I that that really does make like it warms my heart to think mm-hmm. of a kid who maybe had trouble getting out of bed. Who you know the your mom says, but you can watch Pokemon, and that kid gets up and. It's cool to it. Listen for all the positive, negative, blah blah blah. I'm very 
humbled to be a part of that. Mm. I know that sounds cheesy, but. I well, love it, thinking of little young Steve in his jammies with the footsies. If I, if, and... if I could elaborate on that, I distinctly remember first uh, coming across Pokemon because uh, I have an older brother, and he was in he was in middle school while I was still in elementary school. Uh, so he was waking up early. So I decided to just wake up early too, you know, just to be up at the same time as my brother. And yeah, there was uh, I remember uh, WB eleven had aired plenty of cartoons on a, on a weekday morning. And I remember, you know, sometime between six thirty and seven, like turning on my TV and it's like a CR TV. So when you turn it on, you hear the audio first before the picture came in. And I just remember hearing, and this is how I heard it. I heard something say coffee. And then I see this floating purple ball going across the screen. I'm like, what the hell's going on? It's a Japanese cartoon and it's a purple ball called coffee uh of course oh, it's coughing not, it, coughing and i remember going to school and just like telling people i'm like oh there's this crazy ass show <laughs> on at 6 30 in the morning and everyone's like yeah yeah, yeah whatever and then yeah it, it, it took a matter of weeks before everyone was talking about it and then wow. yeah the rest is history <laughs> now that you said coffee you just reminded me the biggest question that i've had since the start of this podcast I wanted to know if he was, I know the Nintendo company was primarily responsible for naming the Pokemon, giving them Mm -hmm. the English names, but I did hear him say somewhere that he was slightly involved in that. I wanted to hear what names didn't make the cut. Like, I would love to know if, like, there was an alternate name for Clefairy or, Mm -hmm. you know, an alternate name for Coughing. Um, you know, maybe that reminded kids too much of illness and they, you know, there was a debate like I, those are the kinds of meetings that I would have loved to have listened in on. Um, but hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to him again because that was super, super interesting. Um, he also clarified the, the confusion with how the actors contracts, uh, affected them being able to continue with the show. So, from what I, I took away from that, um, they did this sunset clause did exist, um, and the actors did have to make a decision. It was either stick with a bunch of shows that four kids was working on, or leave that and go work on Pokemon and kind of break the contract. Where he said that they could have done that. He wasn't going to like sue them for that, but I guess what what that meant unofficially was that they they couldn't come back to four kids. Like that was mm-hmm. a choice they had to make. Um, and again, it's a long time ago, so people's memories uh, are different about that time. But that was a very uh, – th- it was a confirmation about this clause in the contract. So so I appreciate having clarity about that. For sure. Um, well, that wraps up our uh, interview. Um, guys, we forgot to say this in the intro, but if you want to – uh, get access to these episodes early and ad-free and get bonus content. You can go to patreon.com slash 4 Uh There you can uh, pay a little money and, and have access to those things. What else can they do, Steve? Well, you uh, you could go to our website. That's 4 com with the number four. You know, uh, Subscribe to us on whatever podcasting platform you're listening to. You know, this is something I forgot to mention for a while. Kick us a little review, you know. Yeah, write a review, even nice. or just just five stars. Just hit the five star <laughs> button. You don't even have to write anything. It's so easy. It. And you know, lets us know we're 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 doing a, uh, uh, at the very least, a decent job chronicling uh, the history of this uh, company yeah. as best we can. Save uh, your and- bad reviews for writing us, you know, a mean email. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and then also we have an online store too. Uh, mm-hmm. I, wow, I forget what the link is off the top of my head. Um, but... It's it's in the link tree. Uh, you can go to our website, just click on shop. You can go to fourkidsflashback.com, click on shop, and um, you can get all kinds of merch with the logo Steve created yeah, for the show. Yeah, if you show. like it all that much, yeah. Then show your pride. <laughs> your Four Kids Flashback pride. Um, if you want to post about the show, use hashtag Four Kids Flashback. Mm-hmm. Um, We'll start doing some uh, some challenges up there, some questions that you guys can answer using that hashtag. And um, yeah. a little peek behind the curtain here, you know, a lot of these episodes are still recorded way in advance, way in advance so much that this podcast hasn't even launched yet. So yeah, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I wanted to really uh, get 
as many episodes recorded before we launched as possible so that I could arrange them in a way that chronologically made sense and also to alternate between giving you guys uh, an interview with an actor versus a behind the scenes person. So if you're wondering why we're talking like this hasn't aired yet, it's because it hasn't. Uh, but yeah, that was, thank you for pointing that out, Steve. Thank you so much for listening. Um, thank you for being a friend and we'll catch you next time. Four Kids Flashback is a production of Maji Media, hosted by Tara Sands and Steve Yurko. Producers are Zach Logan, Tara Sands, and Steve Yurko. For more information, go to fourkidsflashback.com. That is the number four. And if you worked at Four Kids and have a story you want to share, please email us at fourkidsflashback at gmail.com. You can find us on social media at Four Kids Flashback. And to listen early and ad free, head to patreon.com slash fourkidsflashback. For podcast merchandise, find links on our website and link tree. As they say on every podcast, if you liked this show, please subscribe, rate, and review, and tell your friends, or four. If you want to check out other Maji Media podcasts, go to Maji, M-A-J-I, dot media. Thanks for listening.